Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I wanna to talk about some ideas that I've had rolling around in my head for the last few months, um, especially after a very short conversation with the BookTuber uh, Bookshore in one of the comment sections of one of Leaf by Leaf's videos. See, I'm a medievalist. I'm an academic who specializes in Old Norse Icelandic literature and language, um, as well as uh, Old English, Middle English, Old French, and Latin kind of thrown in there. I work a lot with um, translations between these languages, so I have to kind of do a lot of the language work. However, as you can probably guess, I'm also an avid reader of contemporary literature. Um, and one of the movements that I'm most interested in is postmodernism, and especially the kind of postmodern maximalist novel that is highly represented right here, right? From David Foster Wallace, Roberto Bolaño, uh, Mathis Sennard, who I would consider to be w w within this genre, Lucy Elman, Pynchon, whom I own a lot more than I've actually read, but don't tell anyone. Um, Volman, which I promise you I have a very large stack of Volman underneath this. Um, even to some who might not be considered uh, within this genre, but seems to kind of get thrown in with this same milieu, right? Uh, William Gaddis, uh, Georges Perec, Don DeLillo, I guess, is a part of this, Zadie Smith, um, Milo uh, Miljenko Zerkovich's new book, Kin, um, is very much kind of influenced in this, as well as uh, Sergio de la Pava and Evan Dara, um, among others. And I suppose you could even throw in Haruki Murakami, who is kind of in this mold, but whom I, I don't really like that much anymore, but was a big impact on my reading, uh, on my reading uh, in my early 20s. So I kind of have my foot in these two worlds. One, um, seriously, is it's my job, um, and the other as a hobby that I can't seem to shake. Um, I really should probably find a less time-consuming hobby, but... It hasn't worked out yet. <laughs> but what I want to do in this video is explore how I actually read a lot of medieval literature through that lens that is offered by these postmodern maximalist books. That is, I think approaching medieval literature through this lens is actually a pretty good idea, as a lot of what the authors are trying to do in these maximalist books resonates a lot with what authors during the Middle Ages were trying to do with their books. So I want to first explore some sort of working definition for a maximalist book um, and look at some key ideas for that genre. And then I want to look at some medieval literature that I focus on, that I really like, that I think can benefit from approaching it in the same way that we approach these big books. And the point of all of this is the basic and perhaps naive hope that the readers who love these massive modern books will take a step into my world and read some of the medieval literature that I love so much. And I really do think that um, if you like this stuff, you'll really like what you find in medieval literature. To start though, we need to get some sort of working definition going. What is maximalism? Well, it's not minimalism. That's the easiest definition, um, as it is just a reaction to minimalism in a lot of ways. But I think a better definition is offered by Stefano Ercolino, who gives 10 elements that he argues defines and structures these maximalist books within the um, kind of scope of the modern novel. And I'll go through them quickly. I'll try to do this as quick as possible, so I'm paraphrasing, trying to use Ercolino's language as much as possible, but please do note that by paraphrasing, I'm obviously missing out on a lot of detail and a lot of nuance. But these criteria are, one, length. These books are long. Pretty self-explanatory. Two, the encyclopedic mode. This one is also pretty self-explanatory, but an important part of this one is that these novels often have a multiplicity of, quote, social, historical, and cultural realities. Ercolino points to the long and uh, varied descriptions of painting and cinema in Bolaño's 2666. He also points to the varied styles and genres of that text and how it kind of moves between different voices pretty fluidly. The encyclopedic mode also makes the text work as a kind of archive, as it includes all of these various things that, at first glance, perhaps don't directly relate to the plot of the book, but they're really important to understanding the book. And this one, the encyclopedic mode, is actually uh, one that I think we can find a lot of common ground with, with a lot of medieval literature, and we'll come back to this in a little bit. Three, dissonant chorality. Essentially the idea that not a single voice, character, or, na or narrative thread dominates the book, but there is, again, this multiplicity. Multiplicity is obviously very important for postmodernism. Again, 2666 is a really good example as it has the five parts from five different um, kind of character perspectives or groups of characters, I suppose. And Ercolino kind of points to the various narrative threads in Infinite Jest, of course. Um, number four, diegetic exuberance. 
These novels contain a vast amount of stuff that don't necessarily relate to the plot, but they're important. There are tons of digressions and stuff like that. Um, David Letzler uh, might, might call this stuff alongside some of the encyclopedic stuff cruft. Number five, completeness. Again, pretty self-explanatory. These novels almost always all come together in the end. There's a systematic interconnectedness between every thread, and at the end, all of the threads are tied off um, in this big climactic kind of finale. Think of the um, climactic ending of uh, De La Pava's A Naked Singularity, or the climactic ending of um, Zadie Smith's White Teeth, confined for a second there. Um, there's also in this, in this uh, completeness um, often a, a temporal element to this, and it's often in the form of circularity. Again, the best example of this is the ending of 2666. Number six, narratological omniscience. These novels often have an alternating narrator that moves freely between characters, but also moves uh, freely between relative distance to these characters, right? Sometimes we're inside the head, the anxious, paranoid head of a character, and other times we'll zoom out and we won't get inside those characters' heads, and other times we'll zoom out even further and have this kind of omniscient view of history or of, 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 of the West or something like that. Number seven, paranoid imagination. This is essential to postmodernism as a whole, um, and this is something that Honestly, we don't really see that much of in medieval literature, um, though someone could potentially make the argument that we see it a little bit when we have um, Christian writers writing about non-Christian figures that, that they actually do admire, um, like we see this in Beowulf quite a bit, um, but it's a bit of a stretch, honestly. This is really a post-World War II thing. Number eight, intersemiosity. These novels often tend to be polymorphic and often reference different media like cinema and music and paintings and stuff like that, and what all of these descriptions do is just add more and more layers of symbolic and morphological meaning to the novel. Number nine, ethical commitment. These texts aren't just neutral observers of the human experience or anything like that, but they're often making arguments about culture or society or humanity. And number 10, hybrid realism. These novels have a very particular kind of realism that you can always pinpoint pretty easily. They're not quite um, realist, and they're not quite non-realist or surrealist. Um, uh, Ercolino just simply calls it hybrid realism, and he goes into more detail. The characters and events are often exaggerated or grotesque or just weird or ridiculous. Again, this one's pretty easy to recognize if you've read um, Thomas Pynchon or, or William Gaddis, for example. Okay, so in a very postmodern and kind of maximalist way, we have a working definition, I think. Most maximalist novels exude these 10 things. Cool. So we could very easily, I think, take any one of these things or any two of these things and apply it to almost any literature, right? This could easily apply to the Odyssey or the Iliad or Virgil's Aeneid, or this could very easily apply to, say, the Tale of Genji or the Mahabharata or the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, all of which I think uh, you know, readers of these big books would really like, and in fact, I actually need to do more reading of those books as well. But all of these, all of these ancient books um, do kind of fit some of the modes that these maximalist books do. I mean, at the very least, they're they're maximalist, right? They're not minimalist. And indeed, someone with a better understanding of all of those books or all of those regions and, and genres might want to do that. But what I really want to turn to now is looking particularly at Western medieval literature, just because that's what I know. The length and encyclopedic mode and diegetic exuberance and intersemiosity and ethical commitment of the maximalist novel could very easily apply to, you know, Dante's Commedia, which for some reason I only happen to have this uh, version of. Or, of course, this could very easily apply to the Canterbury Tales, this massive work work of literature. Or, you know, uh, Thomas Mallory's Le Motateur or William Langland's Pierce Plowman. And for a lot of these, I would really argue that there's really only a difference of scope, at, at least insofar as, they, as it applies to um, multiple parts of the definition. Obviously, these books aren't going to um, tick off every single part of Ercolino's um, uh, definition. But let's focus in on a work that I'm very familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with as well. And that work is the Old English poem Beowulf. And I should note that I'm not the, only, I'm not the first person or anything like that to read Beowulf through a postmodern lens. Um, you see behind me, uh, there's, I, I have a collection of essays called The Postmodern Beowulf, 
um, in which they do this kind of thinking a little bit. So how and why can we read Beowulf through this lens? Well, I think it actually hits most of the 10 criteria that I just listed. It's long. Length is relative, I think. And when it comes to Old English uh, poetry, Beowulf is really only rivaled by the retelling of Genesis uh, in the Junius manuscript. Outside of, Gen outside of Genesis, it's the longest poem in Old English. And Beowulf is certainly encyclopedic. Uh, we get all these references to all these Germanic heroes and Germanic um, historical events and all this different stuff that don't seem to necessarily directly relate to the plot. Um, you know, it has some dissonant chorality as we jump between characters in the main narrative and we jump out of the main narrative into these digressions. Further, we move outwards quite a bit into these much larger and top-down Christian history themes, right, which also ticks the narratological omniscience. And I should be clear here at, at, the start of, at the start of our discussion of Beowulf that the poem that we call Beowulf um, isn't called Beowulf in the original, right? That's a modern title. In the manuscript, in the Beowulf manuscript, um, it just begins, what we gardena in yer dagum, right? Um, listen, in, in the times of old, um, in bygone days, the spear Danes did, and then it goes on, right? That is, 19th century readers of the poem, when they rediscovered the, the, man, the manuscript, they called the poem Beowulf because he is sort of the main character, and what 19th century um, literary experts expected of a novel was to focus on a single character. And this poem is inarguably focused on Beowulf, but by the way. But it's interested in a lot of other characters um, and ideas and events. Um, and Beowulf himself doesn't even enter the story until a few hundred lines in. And in fact, he isn't one of the Spear Danes that uh, the opening of Beowulf suggests this poem is really about, right? The Hwatawe Gardena in Yer Dagum. Uh, he isn't one of those Garden of the Spear Danes. Further, there's a diegetic exuberance to an extent, and of course, completeness, intersemiosity, and an ethical commitment in this poem. But let's look at a moment in Beowulf to illustrate um, some of this. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Beowulf, that's totally fine. At this point in the story, Beowulf just defeated Grendel, spoiler, um, uh, by ripping off his arm. <laughs> uh, Grendel, armless, flees. Um, into the, the fens, into, into the swampy area, and dives into a mirror, basically running home mortally wounded to his mother's house. And there's obviously a ton to be said about what leads up to this fight scene and the fight scene itself, but that's another video entirely. After Beowulf defeats Grendel, the Spear Danes and the Geats are all hanging around Heorot, which is this grand hall that King Hrothgar um, uh, built. And King Hrothgar is the king who sort of patronized uh, uh, Beowulf to come and kill Grendel in a way. So a few of Hrothgar's men chase Grendel to this mirror, saw that he went in, assume that he died, um, and are on their way back to Heorot, presumably to join in on this big feast. But on the way home, they begin reveling in Beowulf's victory, and they begin telling each other all these stories, which really destabilizes the narrative as we're sucked into these, these multiple di digressions. And I'll just read from the text. Um, and just for simplicity's sake, I'll just read from uh, from Heaney's translation, though it's not my favorite translation, and I, I don't think it's the best, uh, but it's it, it's the most popular, so it'd be easiest to just do this. And I'll, I'll also just read the modern translation, because, you know, just for brevity's sake. Um, but the text reads, Meanwhile, a thane of the king's household, a carrier of tales, a traditional singer deeply schooled in the lore of the past, linked a new theme to a strict meter. The man started to recite with skill, rehearsing Beowulf's triumphs and feats in well-fashioned lines, entwining his words. He told what he'd heard repeated in songs about, about Sigmund's exploits, all, all of those many feats and marvels, the struggles and wanderings of Whale's son, things unknown to anyone except to Fatella, feuds and foul doings confided by uncle to nephew when he felt the urge to speak of them. Always they had been partners in the fight, friends in need. They killed giants. Their conquering swords had brought them down. After his death, Siamon's glory grew and grew because of his courage when he killed the dragon, the guardian of the horde. Under gray stone he had dared to enter, all by himself, to face the worst, without Fatella. But it came to pass that his sword plunged right through those radiant scales and drove into the wall. The dragon died. His daring had given him total possession of the treasure hoard. 
his to dispose of however he liked. So in the middle of this poem about Beowulf, ostensibly about Beowulf, we get this long digression. And I should note here that uh, this is just one example. There are multiple uh, there are multiple digressions that many readers, my students at least, often skim over um, and completely forget about as again, they, they don't seem to relate to the main plot at all. But for me, this digression works as a sort of footnote or a hyperlink to Beowulf's story. Ignoring it would be like, you know, not reading the footnotes of David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest. That is, this story that this shope, which is basically the old English word for a scald, um, the story that he's telling is this rather famous story that we get in the Old Norse Icelandic um, saga, Rusunga Saga, um, which is about this guy named uh, Sigurd Fafnisbana, Sigurd Dragon's Bane, or Fafnir is the name of the dragon, so Fafnir's Bane. Um, uh, though in Beowulf he's called Siamund or Sigmund, um, which a lot of people wonder a lot about um, uh, why the Beowulf poet changed the name. Did, did he misunderstand it or did he just um, change it? And I think there's a pretty clear and easy reason for this switch. Um, I, think the, I think the poet is just making a conscious pun and a reference to Beowulf, who just defeated Grendel in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Sigmund, or Siamund in Old English, just means victory hand. Sia, victory. Mund hand. This author has a thing with hands, and he, he's always kind of punning um, um, on, on hands. Um, but anyways, the reason I think that this is relevant is that this is a reference to another hero from another story that the audience of Beowulf might know, right? They probably know about Sigurd Fafnisbane, but they might not know it. And those who do know the story can make this connection, and what they'll find is this wonderful new lens through which to view the Beowulf story that they're reading right now. There's a reason why Beowulf is compared to Siamund uh, of all Germanic heroes. And there's a reason why both Siamund and Beowulf are referred to with this Old English word Aglaka, which um, uh, the only other beings in this poem who are referred to using the word Aglaka are Grendel, Grendel's mother, and the uh, ultimate dragon. Did this word mean something like awe-inspiring one, or terrible one, or formidable one? Though a lot of modern translators, Seamus Heaney, um, kind of glosses over it and, and translates it as hero or something like that when it refers to Beowulf or Siamund, and translates it, translates it as a monster when it refers to Grendel, Grendel's mother, or the dragon. But of course, this word uh, that's being used is, off, is, is kind of, um, to be an academic, problematizing the borders of heroism and monstrosity that this poem is actually really interested in. But what I'm getting at here is that this is exactly the referentiality and encyclopedic style that many postmodern maximalist fictions um, use. That is, you don't have to get the references to understand the book, but if you do get the reference, it adds just another layer of symbolic or morphological or etymological meaning to the story. And it gives you another lens through which to approach the story. And this goes on throughout Beowulf. There are references to Christian history. There's all these references to, to Cain and the mark of Cain when it, comes to, when it comes to Grendel. And there's all these references to these events and people of Germanic history, never mind all the biblical allusions that, that are made throughout this poem. All of this adds layers and layers to this poem that someone without all of this knowledge wouldn't understand. But again, that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. A lot of postmodern maximalist um, fiction takes us to the extreme, of course. Um, you know, the, I think the best example is probably, um, if you can barely see it, but um, Lucy Elman's Duck's Newburyport, which is essentially just references. The references in Duck's Newburyport are the point, right? It's the, the most extreme version of, of referentiality in, in, the, in these works. But these references in Duck's Newburyport are essential to understanding our narrator. They're in fact the only way we can understand our narrator. Um, just as these digressions in Beowulf help us understand the character of Beowulf and the, the point of the poem as a whole. So all of that was just one digression in the poem Beowulf, which is, you know, 3,182 lines. But if we want to add even more layers to this lens of understanding, um, we need to take Beowulf into account in its manuscript context, right? We don't just get Beowulf in this in like a, a slim volume. It's in a larger manuscript with a bunch of other work. The manuscript that is preserved in is called the Beowulf Manuscript or the Noel Codex, I think how you want to call it. And just to make everything more confusing, the kind of 
larger manuscript that that manuscript is attached to um, is referred to as shelf mark um, uh, 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 Cotton Vitellius A15. But the Beowulf manuscript includes five texts. It includes a Life of St. Christopher. It includes a text called The Wonders of the East. It includes um, the letters from Alexander to Aristotle, then Beowulf, and then a short poem called Judith. Importantly here though, those the, the, the two prose texts, The Wonders of the East and The Letters of, uh, of Alexander to Aristotle, um, both offer encyclopedic lists. That's essentially all they are, is it, these encyclopedic lists um, of all these marvels and creatures and people um, and wonders that uh, people can encounter in the Far East, right? They're kind of these travel narratives. And they're both clearly interested in the bounds of humanity in, in these far off cultures and all that kind of stuff. But they also very much remind me of the encyclopedic mode of many postmodern maximalist books as they try to make order out of the multivalent chaos of the world, all the while reveling in this chaos. And in fact, I've actually just recently been reading um, Umberto Eco's uh, Badalino, and he makes multiple references to these um, far off creatures uh, uh, in the East. That, that is exactly the stuff that we see in the Beowulf manuscript in The Wonders of the East and Letters from Alexander to Aristotle. This viewpoint of looking at the full manuscript rather than just a single poem is a basic tenet of the academic movement of new philology, um, which essentially argues that we should try to understand the surviving texts within their manuscript context rather than um, you know, extracting them and separating them and anthologizing them like we tend to do um, quite a bit. And this is quite interesting because it forces us to ask questions like, what do the wonders of the East or the letters from Alexander to Aristotle have to do with a story about this heroic man killing all of these, all of these monsters? Why are these in the same manuscript? What were these monks thinking about? And of course, this is the exact same question that we need to ask ourselves when we're reading Roberto Bolaño's 2666. Why do we get these long lists of all these femicides alongside this love, tri this love triangle between um, Norton, uh, uh, Pelletier and Espinoza. Why are they in the same book? Or it's like when you read a collection of short stories. You can anthologize one and take one out of the context of the others, but by doing that you're losing, or I guess perhaps just changing, um, the way people read that short story. Right? There's a reason why it was placed in that collection uh, uh, with the immediate context of that collection. This video is getting a bit long, but I also want to note how the sagas of the Icelanders work in this way as well primarily through their massive casts of characters and references that, again, if one wants to understand the sagas fully, one needs to know all of these references and all of these characters that are being referenced. There's a reason why I have a, a nifty folder full of family trees from every single saga that, that, that I've ever read. You know, some are nice and short, like Gisli's saga, um, where I have one page of a nice family tree, and others are, well, quite massive. This is my family tree for Njal Saga, which is three pages taped together. The sagas of the Icelanders were written, say, from around the year 1200 to around the year 1400. Um, and they almost all take place during the settlement age in Iceland, say, uh, around the year 870 to around the year 1020 or 1050, I guess. But that is to say that almost all of these sagas take place during the exact same time. And therefore we get a lot of the same characters in different sagas as they're talking about the same time period. And Iceland is a pretty small country, relatively speaking, um, and there weren't that many people there. But what the sagas do that's so interesting that I think someone who, who just reads one saga might not uh, pick up on right away is the author uses the audience's perceptions of these characters from other sagas to either comment on those sagas or to comment on the, the, the characters or the saga that they're writing. For example, if you're reading Fostbrother Saga, um, you'll note that there's a guy who shows up pretty early named Grettir Aus Mundersen, um, and he doesn't really play a role in the story. So you're, asked, you're, you know, you're kind of left to ask, what is this guy doing in this, in this story? Well, go read Grettir Saga. Uh, and you'll soon figure out why the characters in Fosbrada Saga meet up with Grettir. And further, while reading Grettir Saga, you'll likely come across well, hundreds of characters. That, that, that saga's uh, pretty big. Um, but for example, you'll come across a character named, uh, uh, named Bjorn, champion of the Heaterdal people. What's he doing in Grettir Saga? Well, go read Bjorn Saga. 
um, and, and, and figure it out. And I should note here that, of course, um, when reading any of these, we need to kind of be very careful and keep straight when each saga is written, right, to figure out, uh, you know, who's referencing whom here. But these authors are clearly working within this milieu of saga writing, and they're clearly referencing other sagas and other characters and other authors. That is, the best part about reading the sagas, I think, are encountering this world unto itself, where you're welcome to read all the different sagas and witness this cast of characters who are being commented on in different ways by different authors at different times. The Bjorn in Bjorn Saga is very different than the Bjorn in Gratia Saga, for instance. But if we take a postmodern approach, we can see how all of these characters are being actively negotiated and played with by our authors. And we get this multivalence to this world of settlement age Iceland. And I noted uh, uh, my family tree of Njal Saga earlier, um, because this, the cast of characters in some of these sagas is really no joke. It, it makes keeping the characters in William Gaddis' J.R. straight pretty easy. Not quite, but still. But like maximalist fiction, the encyclopedic memory of these, of these sagas work as an archive in some way. It also creates a, decentra a decentralized narrative as we move from character to character and generation to generation, getting all these side stories that don't necessarily affect the plot. But of course, they affect the way we read the text that we're reading. Like Beowulf, you know, Njal Saga is called Njal Saga, but it's not just about Njal. It's about his extended family, his district, and honestly, it's about Iceland, the history of Iceland up, up to this point. Njal Saga does something incredibly similar for medieval Iceland to what um, Kin, which I'm reading right now, does for Croatia and for Europe of the 20th century. The sagas are not unlike the you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe or many modern fantasy series in a way. You can follow individual characters through these stories that aren't necessarily focused on them. It's destabilizing. In a way, you understand each individual saga more the more other sagas you read. Um, the hundreds of stories about King Arthur, right, Ar Ar Arthuriana um, in the Middle Ages work like this as well. Really, Arthuriana is the MCU for Western Europe in the Middle Ages. And lastly, all of these stories are told in various voices, right? The prose in the sagas, at least, is constantly interrupted by these verses, by, by poetry. Um, we get the you know, short poems, and we also get these very long narrative poems. And of course, we could look at the manuscript context of every single saga in order to get more lenses through which uh, uh, to view these sagas. So... I could go on and on about the sagas, um, and I'll definitely be making more videos about them um, because they're just a treasure trove that modern readers, I really think, would love. They, they read like modern novels, um, and they're just, they're so much fun. But for now, what are some conclusions? Well, firstly, I think we just saw some pitfalls to just taking a series of genre definitions and placing it onto another body of work um, from another time and place. Clearly, you can't do this with perfect results. Clearly, uh, I was doomed to fail from the start of this video. It's reductive. However, I do think that if we use some of the approaches that we take when we approach postmodern maximalist fiction and transport them to our readings of medieval literature, we'll come to more greatly appreciate medieval literature, um, as I really do think that they're doing a lot of the same things with their multivalent lenses, their diegetic exuberant tendencies, and their multiplicity of voices, an encyclopedic mode um, that, again, these, these modern books are also doing. I think we only gain in our reading of medieval literature if we take this modern approach to analyzing them. So I hope I've convinced someone in this incredibly long video, my God, uh, uh, to read more medieval literature. Again, I don't think we should necessarily approach medieval literature as something entirely different or entirely distant, although the cultures that produced them were different, and we should accept that. But I think we can approach them in the same way that we approach postmodern maximalist fiction, that is, with wonder, awe, and a healthy amount of confusion, all mixed with the noble intention of trying to understand these densely elusive and referential texts. Thanks for watching. Now I gotta put all of these away. Oh my God.